be another five up. Should be able to hold 20 here while I'm right into it. Still coming straight up the wall. So what signifies the end of the dive? Like, I know we have a general plan, make it to waypoint three, and it's going to be around this time. But is there like a hard, fast rule? Like, if we don't make it to waypoint three, no matter what, we have to keep going until we make it there? Or is it just like, well, it's time to pull out? It depends on the dive. Um, there, there is not a hard, fast rule um, on this ship, which is really nice because we've got the flex we've got a lot of flexibility, and, and all the teams are really responsive to being able to change on the fly, which is really nice. Um, so it really depends on it's an operational constraint um, for the most part, is and and just an allocation of resources. Sure we've got I forget how many sea mounts are here, something approaching 100 sea mounts in the US oh. EZ around Kingman and Palmyra. Uh, we visited all of like 15 of them or something um, total. And so how much right. time do you spend characterizing one seamount versus how much time do you, or how many seamounts do you want to get to? Uh, um, not quite so here. we're trying to get through a range of depths here um, to kind of hit through the coral sweet spots and see some of the major transition points Push on this, this feature. Like more. I would like to get up to the, um, this is a, a gear or a table mount and I'd like to get up to the top so we can see the okay. transition onto the top. Go away. Um, but a lot of it is, is the logistics of just trying to allocate ship time across a large area. Um, then we try and recover watch changes so we don't have to wake anyone up or wake fewer people up to help with launch recovery because that's very personnel intensive. Uh, and then there's some other considerations and stuff like just kind of trying to avoid um, launching and recovering right during mind. meal times think we are to ready. make the steward's like live easier. So there's a whole bunch of different competing interests Go um, for it. to make that decision, and there's definitely not a single hard and fast uh, rule sure. for the most whatever, part. Whatever you think. It looks like, um, yeah, yeah, that'll work. Roger. in a bit there for us to mm. that's good thanks is that a primnoid I actually think it's a bamboo right now see the see how big fat and fleshy the polyps are mm -hmm. from this distance that's generally a prim uh, uh, bamboo or acidided acidid uh, characteristic more than a primnoid, but I can't see bands yet. These purple are. Yeah. Yep, yeah, this is a bamboo. It's a nodal branching bamboo. That is a definitely a new one for this dive. And we just got a comment online saying it was from the J clade. Uh, there, Darryl, give us some pull -ups. I remember you talking about the clades uh, during the bio identification boot camp. Yep. All right, science is happy. Thank you. All right. Okay. For those of you watching on Nautilus Live who. Uh, also really into the deep sea, feel free to fill out the uh, request form to become a scientist ashore and join us in the science chat as well. Yeah, that's a great point. We have so many um, experts who are typing into the general chat, which is awesome. But if they have really great, valuable knowledge, it would be helpful to see it on the science side of, of things. So we had a request come in. Uh, is there any kind of preservative that does not strip color out of specimens? Formalin? I feel like even formalin strips it out a lot. I. But it is better. It's it's going to depend per each. 
the type of pigment and the type tax, excuse me, each type of taxa, um, if you're really trying to do that, um, I think you probably can find preservatives, but you know, each pigment is going to be chemically different, and I suspect you could f eventually find a combination that would do less, um, but that's probably going to change by type of organism you're working with. We use primarily alcohol and a little bit of formalin here. Um, What's the benefits of uh, formalin versus alcohol? So formalin is much more toxic, so we try and avoid using it. It's a little bit better, maybe, from a, a little bit broader. It preserves things a little bit better in terms of the morphologies in the alcohol. The alcohol is a bit, a bit better for genetics, uh, if you want to actually pull uh, genetic material, 95% um, ethyl alcohol will preserve the genetic material fairly well. Um, if we were going to be doing a lot of ge you know targeted genetic for stuff, we'd use probably something a little bit different. If you want to target RNA, you'd use something a little bit different. Um, alcohol really broadly is the most versatile for the expense and ease of carry. Um, and formalin helps fix tissues a little bit better. If you want to do any kind of histology or something like that, you're better off with uh, formalin. Looks like a Paragorgia black coral and probably actually two black corals, I think. So this is most likely a bubblegum coral. Pull it out tiny. When I see these with their polyps out, I always have a little nagging voice that it might be Swiftia, but I'm pretty sure that's a Paragorgia. Question for the whole van. What is your favorite cryptid or ocean creepy creature? Mine, of course, is going to be a mermaid. Hands down. Mm. Sorry, repeat the question. Cryptid what is your favorite ocean cryptid? Cryptozoology. Cryptozoology. Um. I don't know. I mean, there's things you haven't seen, like I would probably say a colossal squid. We know it's real, but we still haven't seen one live or, and live in its native habitat. So what's the difference between a colossal squid and a giant squid? Uh, taxonomically, I'm not sure, but they are different, recognized as different species. Um, what exactly makes up the description I, uh, are the differences I don't know. I'll push in a bit there on the dog toy, Daryl. Another coral formerly known as Anthemastus or Pseudoanthemastus. Daryl, do you have a favorite uh, crypto ocean cryptid? Oh, the Kraken. Kraken. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking of uh, Johnny Depp running away from the Kraken for some reason on the Black Pearl. Oh, gosh, those movies. Chris, you got a favorite? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, can go in. From the northwest, the Pacific giant octopus. Ooh. Coralie? I like them all. I like <laughs> all of these. The Miss America answers. answers. World peace among the oceans. <laughs> uh, I like the idea of a kraken. You know, I like the idea of a giant or colossal squid. I also like mermaids, too. <laughs> <laughs> we will be out here when the new Little Mermaid gets released. I know. I'm sad that I'm missing it. 
Sure. I feel like I'm. Let me look at the yellow one quickly. I'm definitely trying to lower my expectations yeah, right. for the new Little Mermaid. Why are you? Because every time they do a live action, I get my hopes up, and then I watch it, and I'm like, mm, no, no. Like the Lion King. I like the Lion King. The live action one. Yeah, I mean, oh. I know people are upset because it was live action, quote quote unquote live action. Yeah. Um. So you like couldn't see their more. emotions as well as in animated. Yeah, I think this is an account of Gorgia. Yeah, I I'm, do think I'm good people here. If we can fly out and look at the stalk, uh, the whip above it as we go. Right. Okay, and go like. Uh, yeah, I do think there, people there like just live yeah, action, just the left pure the pan. Roger. Okay, zoom in again. Oh, okay. I haven't seen that one yet. That one's old. That one's from like the 2000s. Oh, yeah. wait, the really, really... Um, so this is a black coral. Yes, yeah, so it came out like years okay. ago. Mm -hmm. That one was away. really good. I really enjoyed that one, but that wasn't Disney. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Maybe that's the secret. <laughs> Of the live actions, it's definitely Aladdin wins. It's definitely what? Aladdin. Like oh, the, Aladdin oh. is good. The live action is definitely Aladdin. I thought that one was all right. Oh, I love I like Will that Smith one. as a genie. Uh. Live action is kind of hit and miss. You never know what you're going to get. I felt like Aladdin was all right. I think the best one was definitely Maleficent. Is that a, was that originally a Sleeping yeah, Beauty? That, that, doesn't uh, that doesn't count because it's a different story. Oh, yeah. boo. Yeah, I feel like that doesn't count either. Well, then does Peter Pan count since it's not Disney? It's the same. It was pretty it's much the exact same story. Disney. Okay. It's still technically Disney. I didn't like Mulan very much. Yeah. I liked Mulan. I was sad that they got rid of Mushu, though. They didn't have any humor. It kind of ruined the story. When you yeah. Don't have any. I've never seen Beauty and the Beast. I watched about half of it, and I was like, meh, okay, I'm good. Yeah, I've never felt a need. No. I did like the Cinderella one. I thought that one was really good. There's a... That was like a, their second or first live action after Maleficent. This is a not. It had the, um, gosh. More interested in the stocked one here. Right. It. One of the guys from Game of Thrones who played the prince. Pushing and then Lily St. James was Cinderella. Hmm. Just the fashion of that there. movie was perfect. And that hit me. So this is another black, stalked black coral. It's a little bit different than the ones we've been seeing earlier. Not sure which one this is. Can I go a little tighter? If you want yeah, there? we can oh. get a, a shot at the, the polypy end. Push in just a little more. Look at the little tiny brittle star. Aw. It's a baby. baby. Yep. All right, that'll be good enough for us to sit down with the books later and figure out what it is. Okay, you can go away, thanks. Oh, actually, the correct answer for best live action is Alice. Alice in Wonderland. Oh. Tim oh, my Alice. gosh. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. That was a really good one. Some more Johnny Depp. Yes. Yeah. But controversial opinion, I never really liked Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh, wow. Oh, my. I know. What are you doing here? I know, I know. <laughs> wow. It was all right. My, deep, my favorite movies. Soundtrack was great. Oh, yeah. Soundtrack's amazing. amazing. 
did a very good job with the score, and it's still a cult classic today. Bring it heading around to the north a bit for us. Roger. I was an orchestra in high school, and we. I was to about play. to say I was a band kid in high school. Yeah. Shocker. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, we got to play Pirates of the Caribbean, and that was such a fun song to play. Uh, Y'all. Or function. it was a it was, uh, medley. Serious trick. I was gonna say something, but from the opposite side. I was going to say, yeah, I remember being a band kid and every other band played Pirates of the Caribbean for the next five years straight. So we would be at competitions and just like, oh, this again. <laughs> oh, their, their drum major is going to be dressed up as Johnny Depp. Without auto heading to get it to come around. What instrument did you play? Ooh, it's always a fun game. What instrument did I play? What do you think? Okay, can you give me, like, horns or winds? Horns. Oh, my Nobody God. Nobody ever guesses correctly. Uh, well, flugelhorn. Flugelhorn. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say French horn because that's the only horn I know. <laughs> if you've got a minute, I'm going to get a close look at that one. Sure. I actually played the tuba. Oh! <laughs> Fun. Pushing a bit there, no? I was such a band nerd, they bumped me up to high school band when I was still in eighth grade. <laughs> wow. So what was your orchestra instrument? This is another paragorgia. Very cute. There we go. With That's the snake star. Shot. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, if down. I had to guess, forward. you also have to guess. Uh, I take it wind? Okay, no. No, close. okay. So was it, so it's definitely yeah, not a horn, right since in. you don't know the horns. I'm going to go with the drum. Yep. Oh, the timpani? Definitely Timpani, yeah. okay. No, no, it wasn't okay. me, though. No? No. So if it wasn't a wind, it wasn't a horn, and it wasn't percussion. What else is it? Strings. Come up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to say viola. I see you as a cello person, but I feel the correct answer is going to be violin. Yes. <laughs> Woohoo! I like to play my violin like a cello sometimes. <laughs> I used to make my orchestra teachers so mad. <laughs> Why are you doing that? So have you ever sailed with Tim? Tim uh, Burbank, the data guru. Yes. He is a huge violin slash fiddle player. Wait, how did I not know that? How did I not know that? I, I didn't know that either. <laughs> <laughs> I always say Tim is like an enigma. You never fully know what's all going on. <laughs> Seriously. But him and his sister were both huge musicians growing up. I didn't even know he had a sister until last year. I didn't even know he had a fiddle. Let's see who can guess my instrument when I was um, in band. Okay, so since band. you were Tennessee or in Oklahoma, I'm going with band over orchestra. Can you uh, take a look at the whip, please? Sure. I want to say slide trombone. Let's go in the woodwind section. Tremendous a bit there. Saxophone. No. Is saxophone, is it in band? I don't think it is. Oh, yeah. it is. Yeah, that's bamboo. Thank you. Okay, can go away. Oboe. Nope. Clarinet. Nope. Flute. <laughs> yes. Ah, what? I never would have guessed that one. Okay. Course. Yeah, that's one of those up, instruments I didn't expect to get into, and then I did. It's a lot of fun in middle school. And now, thanks to Lizzo, flute is having like a, a yes. major moment. Yes. So, Lynette, were you a band nerd? Me? Yes, ma'am. Um, 
I was in band. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I would go so far as to say band nerd, but um, I, oh, do you want to guess? Oh, okay. if you want to like reveal it all, we'll take it. All right. Um, everyone else was forced to guess, so. <laughs> okay, okay, we'll guess, we'll guess. Okay. I think that's, an, let's call that a Canthagorgia. You grew up okay, in Berlin, Minnesota. Wisconsin. Wisconsin, sorry. Close, close. Ooh, I don't know what public education is like there, but I'm going to guess it was band over orchestra. Definitely band over orchestra. Uh, trumpet. Ooh, trumpet and French horn. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> I played the trumpet, but uh, we didn't have very many French horns in our band, so they were like, hey, go play the French horn. So I said, okay. Wow. <laughs> I've always heard that French horn is one of the hardest horn instruments to master. That's what my roommate tells me. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we got I another I love trumpet though. I do too. And umbrella pathies. I love going down to like New Orleans yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. all the brass there. bands out there. Uh, you're good to come up front. Chris, were you in band or orchestra? Uh, yes, I was in band. Okay. Um, I want to say trumpet again. Nope, but it was a horn. Okay. Slide trombone. Yep. Oh. Bam. Am I the only non-band person in the control band? <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> Ren, you're silent over there. Were you band or orchestra? I have zero musical talent and have done neither of those things. <laughs> Push in there real quick, video. Mm. All right, so we got about a 60-40 band versus non-band. Okay, that's good, thanks. Another choral formerly known as Anthemastus. Formerly. <laughs> uh, go wait for me to sit. Right, go, there it is. Another bubble gum, plug <coughs> paragorgid. I'm gonna need a tighter zoom on that one to see what it is. I right, go ahead there. In a bit more. Uh, I think this is a white morph paragorgia being overgrown. So we've got zoanthids and coral here, and I think that's a white morph, yeah, white morph paragorgia. Hmm. All right, thank you. So zoanthids are a common species of, of coral in the coral trade, like aquaria. But down here, they seem more parasitic. You can see both free living and not um, down here. And um, but yes, a lot of times we, we see them most often um, or most noticeable. The zoanthids that are kind of lower and living on their own rocks and whatnot are harder to uh, see sometimes. And this is I'm gonna call this one a plexorid. It may be that same acanthagorgia we've been seeing, but just not as healthy, but I think it's gonna I'm gonna go with a plex different plexorid right now. What is the scientific name for the cement or the bio cement that it uses to hold itself, it's hold fast? Great question, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a, a brittle star here, we've got a crinoid here. Not seeing a lot of the mycids and amphipods and stuff that we normally see hovering <laughs> around 
of these, we'll probably pick up and pick them up more as we get shallower. Right. Yeah. And come up three meters. All right, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, you can go ahead. Thanks. So Brian, going back to the zooanthids, uh, we have a question online asking if the, if the zooanthids really are parasitic, deriving nutrition from their host, or if they're just opportunistic, like, oh, there's a piece of dying coral, let's just go colonize it. Sure, so they are, um, they are not parasitic in the traditional sense of like eating their host or de deriving um, nutrients from their host, but they are parasitic, uh, I guess you, you could call it potentially competition, you know, space competition more than that, but they will infect a existing healthy live coral and then kill it off to steal its skeleton. Um, so they are parasitic in the nature that they steal the host skeleton and then use it. So one of my favorite zoanthids out here, Kumula, Kulu, uh, Kumula Manamana, uh, the, or the gold zoanthid coral, is this beautiful um, zoanthid that will take over another coral's uh, skeleton and then continue to grow its own skeleton on top of the existing skeleton and they can get huge meters, multiple meters across and live mm. for a long, long time. And they're absolutely gorgeous when you find a, a big old uh, Kamula Manamana. So it looks like a Caliphagus stalk sponge. We got a whole bunch of Gorgias, couple black corals yeah. and a Canthagorgia. Nice little pocket of life right here. And that goes back to our discussion last night about how things in the deep sea are so much older with the possibly yeah, the oldest up, organism being a 4,400 year old coral over off of Hawaii. Or as Reddit how noted, Greenland sharks. Fired? Three. It's one of them labeled as blank. No. EDNA, EDNA. No. okay. These whip corals are sometimes the hardest to get an ID on because there are so many different um, varieties that all have a whip-like thing. You've got bamboos that are whips, you've got black corals that are whips, you can get primnoids that are whips. Uh, Chrysogorgids sometimes look like whips from a distance. This is a bamboo with a, an associate squat lobster hanging out on the top of it. Halfway to breakfast time. Mm. Those breakfast pizzas sustained me yesterday. <laughs> it was old pita bread with mustard and. Can we look at the stocked one there? I think that might be our first metallogorgia. Ooh. Go ahead and push in there. This guy here, or the 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 the, the umbrella-looking one right on the it. left. in there a bit more. Yep, this is our first metallogorgia. I thought I saw one earlier in the background. Um, but this is the first good look we've gotten one on this dive. Um, so this is that one I was talking about, kind of the convergent uh -huh. evolution shape with the black corals, um, where the, the um, um, blue lapathies and the metallogorgia being very different types of corals. What is um, that swimming thing? I can't tell. That's all I need for the metallogorgia. Thanks, Are you Dan. good? Yeah. Sorry, I slipped off. That's fine. Break. I just needed to make sure it was a metallogorgia of some type. <coughs> so
So one interesting thing to note is I am the what I am identifying these things are is generally the order, family, or genus level. Um, and so there might be three or four different species here of Metallogorgia we're seeing, um, but teasing apart the families is hard enough um, from live video moving without reference material and or potentially even looking at microscopes or doing genetics. Um, so we're really operating at a a higher taxonomic level than we probably would if we were in an area that was more explored in sh the shallows or on terrestrial where we'll be identifying everything to species or even subspecies. This looks like some type of Chrysogorgi Chrysogorgia. What is that hanging out right there on the uh, right-hand side? It's from a sponge, probably. Ooh. Looks like another Paragorgia with its zoanthid, or potentially zoanthid with its pet Paragorgia. <laughs> fish in the back right or something mobile Can't oh yeah it yeah yeah it looks is it a cuscule again mm, unsure yet i just see the motion yeah Big bathopathies there in the back. This is the biggest one, bigger, biggest ones we've seen yet. I may have just saw the, it's actually seen the motion of that black coral that's waving in the foreground and thought it was a fish. I'm slightly disappointed. I'm pushing there for a second, Daryl. This actually might be a different coral than we've seen. It's still a black, but it looks kind of different than most of the others we've been seeing. It's got a nice little squat lobster associate there. Uh, zoom in on the spotting while we're here. Kind of wedged under a rock there. Oh, I was. Never mind. Come on here. So are squat lobsters only found in the deep sea, or are they common all across the ocean? They are common all across, um, at least the benthos, the, the sea floor. Um, you definitely see them in shallow areas as well, too. Is that about their maximum size? Because I hear about crabs and I hear about lobster, and they get pretty big, but I don't... That falls in, is it? really hear about squat lobsters other than deep sea exploration. Yeah, I, Max Zoom. I don't know. Right. Honestly, my expertise stops when the light starts. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. it can go I think so. I don't know for sure. Once we start getting shallower in about 500 meters, I start struggling even more than I struggle in the deep sea. And then once we cross into that photic zone, it's a totally different game. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm sure we'll find a, a squat lobster expert start typing in here in a moment. Yep, hopefully. So Corley, if you or if a person wanted to learn the basics about geology or learn more about geology, what is something that they should do? That's a great question. Um, probably the most fun thing to do would be to go to a national park, probably out west. Um, there's just so much great geology out there and so many. One of the SCFs was... Mm -hmm. I Daniel. Forgot, yeah, I forgot what his title is. 
he, I don't know what his official Put title was, but it was at Bryce Skelton. Canyon. Yeah, he worked at Bryce. Um, my lab mate actually did the same thing working in Great Basin, and her sister actually uh, does something similar, also working in Great Still Basin. Some polyps. Uh, yeah, but there's still a bunch got a couple of live sections here, even though it's been knocked off. So this is a dead bamboo um, skeleton. You can see those nodes very clearly are proteinaceous joints in between uh, the harder skeleton. Sorry to cut you off, Corley. Go for oh, it. no, no, no. Um, but yeah, or even in Hawaii, there's a lot of, um, great there's geology. Lot, yeah, there's a lot of great geology and where there's okay, great geology in, in a national park, there are people who really want to explain, uh, the, the area to you. So it's probably a fun place to start, but there's so many, there's so much to geology. If there's something really specific you want to learn, you can find all that stuff <laughs> online as well. Bring to the north when you get a chance. So like how I got into geology was uh, in high school, there was an earthquake and it really, no, I was, talking I was so right. confused what was going on or what causes an earthquake. Um, yeah, and so I decided north. to learn a little bit more about it and ended up going to geology in college. <coughs> you should be able to look to the north. And this was in the Yay Valley? Yeah, the <laughs> Yay area. <laughs> Oh, good. Steve is here. <laughs> now I can. Now I will actually know what I'm talking about, or Steve will feed me the actual answers to what these things are. <laughs> Morning, Steve. So Brian, a moment ago, you, we were looking at that bamboo coral and you were saying that is a protonation. Uh, I'm trying to do a, find out what is a protonation? Proteinaceous just means of protein, made of proteins. Oh, okay. When I Google search it, it says an anion derived from, pro, from a protein. And I was like, I don't think that fits. Another big bamboo skeleton it looks like here that's mostly dead and overgrown. This is two big bamboo skeletons might in short order might be good indication of what's to come. Could be. One of the interesting things about deep sea corals is a lot of times we don't see variable size classes. We see a bunch of big things together and a bunch of little things together, even across different um, groups, which is a bit interesting when you think about you know broader scale ecology and when <laughs> recruitment events happen and whatnot. You know, lots of, this is again a good example of why we call these things ecosystems engineers, because even when they're mostly dead, or even sometimes more so when they're mostly dead, they become habitat to so many other things. So Steve, I don't know how long you've been watching, but are, are most of these the Paramecia, or have you, have, do you agree that what we were seeing earlier was Acanthogorgia? This looks like another one of those black corals we've kind of been loosely referring to as staropathies. Nanocrinoid? It's a brightly colored one. Yeah. I'm surprised we've kept the, the crinoids going in such density as we've moved up. We've seen the transition kind of in the coral assemblage, or a little bit about 100 meters ago. Um, but the crinoids have held on strong.
Steve's saying it's a parasocrinus for those big red crinoids we've been seeing. So for those watching at home, uh, if you look on the come up. third quad feet in the front row, you, from right to left, you can see Lynette, the navigator, Dan, Hercules' pilot. Next to Dan on the furthest left is going to be Wren. Wren is piloting Atalanta. Okay, Lynette, I think we're... Okay, 320. Yes, please. Bridge now. Can we move five zero meters, three two zero, please? Thank Bring you. ahead to three two zero when you're in. Interesting. Um. Ooh, you can see it's just starting to get daylight outside. Looks like it's a beautiful sunrise. As long as the breakfast cooking smells don't seep into the van, we'll be in good shape. Amen to that. It's always the worst when you're in the last hour of oh. your watch and you can smell the bacon. Yes. I have definitely been a fan of the breakfast this cruise. Those little mini omelets. Oh, oh. yeah. Those are good. Yes. <coughs> That brings up a good point we don't talk about nearly enough. Is, the food? Uh, well, not the food, the <laughs> ship's crew. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Keeping, keeping the lights on, keeping us fed, um, and all that. Like, we've got a 20-something member uh, of the ship's crew who maintain the ship, drive the ship, maintain all the hotel services that keep the science going. Um, you know, and you think about career tracks um, on in the maritime field, um, you know, Excellent science is, is really not a good way to go to sea. If you no. want to go to sea, being a, a professional mariner of some type is a much better way to get on ships. I get on, at this point, I'm lucky if I get to go to sea once every two years or once a year. Um, when I was younger in my career and was working as ship's crew, I was sailing eight or nine months a year um, sometimes, or at least attached to the ship for that long. Um, so I think of the 50-something people on board, only three or four of us actually have PhDs, and two or three are pursuing PhDs, um, and the rest are engineers, technicians, um, ship's officers, and the like. Looks like we've got some bathopathies here, another potentially paramaricia um, plexorid. Steve, what are the um, black whips we're seeing? And for those of you listening at home, deep sea taxonomist extraordinaire Steve Oskovich has tuned in from his house mm -hmm. in New York and is uh, feeding me taxonomy through our uh, science chat. Zoom in there a bit for us now. So this, this kind of whip or one branching black coral, I have been struggling to figure out what it is all morning, but we've seen quite a bit of it. Okay, it can go wide, thanks. I'm glad you brought up the ship's crew because they really are the unsung heroes of every expedition, especially this. So I did not realize up until last year that there are actual maritime academies across the United States. Hmm. Am I pulling you? Or? Yep, there's, there's several. 
there's I just Google searched it and I was like, okay, so there's six of them. So I didn't think there was any in Texas, but and there's Galveston. Texas, yeah. Yep, Texas A&M Galveston. There's one in Michigan. That makes sense. I know there's one in Maine. No, there's, there's one in there's, California. There's Maine, Mass, California, Texas, the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, New York. Great Lakes. Yeah. And the Great Lakes. So that's all the ones I know of. So that's, there's six total, so we named five. Hey, that's pretty great. When I was a NOAA Corps officer, I did all of my maritime ship driving training at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy in Kings Point, New York. I know so many people who do work in maritime, and they just kind of got their start as being hired on as a deckhand and then started getting their captain hours and then eventually went for their six-pack or their 100-ton. But it sounds like maritime academies are so much better about fast tracking your career. That's a metallic ore jay, Chris. Um, yeah, the, the, the reductions in sea time requirements by going through a command, an academy are huge. If you go up the hawse pipe, as it's called, to start from being an ordinary seaman working through able body all the way up to being a ship's officer and master, that takes thousands of days at sea, um, plus additional academic training. So one of my long-term goals for Corpus Christi and working in the education and science communication fields is we're trying to create a um, a pipeline, I guess, between high schools and Corpus and then starting off with the Port of Corpus Christi to where when you graduate from high school, you can get a job instantly with the port, working on a boat, whether it's a crew boat, a ferry, or... Oh, that's our, that's our first Umbalula of the dive in the sand patch Ooh. there, I think. Push in there. There. Yep, this is our first, I think, first sea pen t at all, uh, and this is an Umbalula. It's a, um, these are kind of the exception for a lot of the corals we've been seeing or coral adjacent organisms um, that uh, can actually grow in the sand. Most of the corals we've been talking about so far require hard ground to anchor, uh, and these sea pens, um, for the most part, specialize in living in uh, more sandy or sedimented soil. There are uh, one group of sea pens called the rock pens that will um, basically suction cup themselves to rocks, um, but most of the sea pens live out in the sediment, like this pretty umbalula. All right, thanks, Dan. We got what we need back here. Okay, you can go wide, thanks. And Steve, we've got room in the bio boxes. If you see something um, that you want sample, just shout. We've we've seen three kind of medium density communities, and we snapped uh, Niskins okay. at all of them, but we haven't gotten a blank yet. This is one of the Brasingid sea stars. Looks like this one has lost a few arms at various Should times in its life. You can kind of see the, the deep red arms of the go. older ones and the shorter, thinner, lighter colored ones are still regrowing after being separated for some reason, either snacked on by something or um, ripped off for some other reason. Okay. So if y'all help me keep a lookout for that white paragorgia again, that would be a good sample target. Okay, you can go in. Going back to the C pin, are they motile or are they stuck in place? They're pretty they stay pretty much where they are.
Bring your head to the left just so a little one? for me. Like 310 we're on now. Yeah, that's the it, the one we saw looked more like okay. the image to the left. Um. Yeah, that. Looks like a little bamboo whip here in the center. So since we are diving on an unnamed geo, uh, is there any thoughts or consideration for naming these or are they just gonna remain unnamed? I don't think anyone on the ship today is gonna probably pursue naming them. Um, it's actually quite a rigorous process to write the description of the, the feature and get it submitted to um, through the naming review process. Um, I've never, I've taken, once or twice it's crossed my mind to try and uh, name a feature and I've honestly looked at how much paperwork it was and didn't do it. Um, but, so there is in US waters at least, um, uh, and international waters as well, there's kind of a formal process to go through um, that is quite a bit of work to do a geological description of the area. Um, so it won't probably be named anytime soon, no. So within U.S. waters, is it NOAA or USGS that you have to go through? Ah, uh, it is neither of those. It's kind of a strange consortium of groups, and I have to go look up exactly what it is. I suspect if this area is designated a sanctuary, um, there will be probably a push to name more of the features in it. Um, and that process would be kind of led or managed by the sanctuary uh, if one's created. So Chris, maybe you know, might know this question. Since we are close to Kingman and Palmyra, were there ever any indigenous communities that uh, stayed at Palmyra or Kingman long term? Uh, there's not been any record of indigenous people populating it full time, but it was most likely used as a stopover for mm -hmm. some fishing, eat some crabs, <laughs> hang out on land for a bit, and then continue on their voyage. Okay. So we have a question about why do, or how do we choose where to explore? And that is a long answer, because we plan these out a couple of years in advance, and then we cement them closer, like a year out. And it's taken, um, takes a lot of input from various scientists, various uh, government entities, a whole community comes behind where we explore. So we've been seeing a lot of light pinks, a couple of reds. Are there any colors that are not found in the deep sea? Oh, it's always hard to just to prove a negative. Um, <laughs> I don't think we see too many greens though. I was just gonna greens say. Are, yeah. Greens are on the rare. There are some plexorids that get pretty green. 
Um, but yeah, that's probably the least. But maybe if we say green, common color, we'll start we'll see, to see, see green. Uh, I'm all about it. See that? Probably should come up a bit. Another one of these Brasingid uh, sea stars. So for those watching at home, you can see on sat feed three, uh, we now have a our map up on the screen. And you can see by all the contours, because uh, this is a contour map, that we are essentially just going up a hill. So Steve and I have been chatting in the text about this black coral whip we keep seeing, and we're, we're Steve suggesting we call it perangiopathies, but is Come up. very not sure um, that that's what it is. Another metallogorgia. Chrysogorgia bush there as well. As we get shallower, we'll probably start picking up more fish too. The fish get thinner and thinner the deeper you go, and then they the fish disappear completely between eight and nine thousand meters. I I know. Uh, Alan Jamison's group just recorded the deepest fish ever, and I don't remember what the depth was, but I think it was 8,000-ish meters. Uh, the snailfish, right? Yep. And it has that high quantities of the protein. I think it's like EK or EGK. Essentially, it's uh, the same protein that's responsible for fish smelling like fish. I, what is that? Fish protein? Um, yes. It's a type of protein that allows them to, uh, fish to go down so deep. And it's three letters like E K G E G T M A U? Mm, no. Oh, but they no. might have discovered a different one. That's fish order fish odor syndrome. So I oh. <laughs> I think that's maybe for you. Got, got a bathopathies here, a couple more uh, a couple large brittle stars. Um Actually, if you're in a good place, Dan, can we go look at one of the brittle stars that's not on a coral that we just flew over? Sure. So last year I made a horrible mistake of all the movies and document or everything that I downloaded for watching was all documentaries. <laughs> that one. God awful mistake, but I learned or, a lot. Or the bottom one, either one. What's that? Um. Oh, well, we can keep moving, I think. I we cannot find We don't need to be here long. It's just it's unusual to see oh, this no, type of sea star, video. or brittle yeah. star, not associated with corals. Oh, they are spiny-armed, OK. Oh, what's he holding? Bottom arm in the frame. It looks like I may be an optical illusion just with the spikes. Oh, yeah, I think that's just its arm is curled, and I'm seeing the spikes. I feel like he's trying to hold the hand of that other star, yeah. though. All right, that's all I need. Thank you. Or okay. leg, arm. Do you call them arms? Yeah, arms. Okay. Arms, legs. We all know what you're talking about. 
I'm bad about using the proper anatomy for all these different groups. If we all understand what we're talking about, it works for me. Okay, so it is a snailfish recorded at over 8,000 meters deep. 8,000, where is it? 8,336 meters down in the Marianas. And it is a protein called trimethyl, triethyl amine inoxide. Uh, this this crinoid that's just on the bottom right looks like it had a he its head bitten off at some point and is regrowing. How can you? Uh, it's tell? just a, it's an assumption based on the thickness of the stalk and the length of the stalk and how tiny the head is. Uh, the head is. I certainly can't be sure, but look at the comparison yeah. of stalk size and head size on this other um, one that's growing on the left. Yeah, that one looks like it's doing much better. So when you say bite off, do you actually mean a fish comes by and bites I, we, it off? I don't know, but you definitely see something is whack. Something will whack their heads off, um, whether it's accidentally or for food. I don't know, and I don't know what it does it. But it's pretty clear that sometimes something uh, damages them. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm assuming it's a mobile predator, but I don't actually have any evidence for that. Some areas you'll see a lot of them that are in various stages of regrowth. Can we look at that one? Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I'm guessing this is going to be Paramarsia, which is a type of um, plexorid. Yeah, that's my that's my guess. We'll see if Steve corrects me. I think this is a type of paramarsia with another one of those nominally or reputatively parangiopathies kind of in the background. But it's certainly a, some type of plexorid. Mm. All right, uh, we're good. Thanks. So we finally made it shallower than 2,000 meters, which for those um, listening at home, that's a little bit deeper than 1.2 miles, slowly ascending our way up. What right. is the depth of the summit of the seamount? Uh, I think the, the true shallow shoalest depth is like 14 something, but okay. the, the edge of the kind of the flat part of the table mount is, um, um, is about 1,600. Oh, here go the oh, taxonomist yeah. making my life harder again. Apparently, Paramaricea day is now a family, not a genius, and half of the and most of the plexorids have moved into that family. <laughs> but Swifty is still a plexorid. Good. And Brian, you nailed that depth. 1,600 feet. That's meters. The top of the, uh, sorry, meters, meters. Top of the geo. Unnamed guilt number eight, the one that we are currently diving on. Oh, that is another Victor Gorgia. That's only the third one we've seen. Let me take a quick look at that. Yep. in a bit there. Yeah. Crash landing. Okay, zoom in it. Well, that's interesting.
That's good enough for me. Okay. Oh, wait. <coughs> the camera's all wonky. Faster. Combine the pointy rock. If you get in a happy position and we see another one of these black coral whips that just like left the screen to the left, let's sample it because we've been having trouble trying to figure out what it is back here. All right. It Was completing the ship move, I think. Yep. Looks like we're going vertical for a while, so. up a bit so I can see where it is. Pointy rocks are good for critters. So for those at home, we are diving on a guillot, G-U-Y-O-T. Uh, a guillot is a flat top or tabletop mountain under the ocean. It once upon a time started off as like an island or or something above the water. And because of weathering and erosion action, it became an atoll. And then through further weathering and erosion action, it started getting, it sunk below the ocean line. We can so take now, a quick zoom on that. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. It is a guillot, a tabletop mountain. This is a nodal branching bamboo. We've seen this one a couple times today already. All right, that's all I need, thank you. Go in. I do those uh, zooms just a little bit slower for us. So a common misconception is that seamounts were once upon a time above the water. Seamounts were islands. Um, Nope, I just found this one out recently too and I feel like it's been blowing my mind and a whole bunch of other marine educators that I've been talking to. So if it is a traditional seamount shape, it never broke the water. And I'm sure there's one or two exceptions somewhere out there in the world. But for the most part, if it's got a seamount shape, never broke the water surface, but a guillot, that tabletop mountain, did get above the water line and that's why it's got that characteristic tabletop. Another bamboo coral I see today. A sea cucumber in the background. Yep, another purple hole thurian.
looks like we've got a paragorgia. Uh, let's just, this is the black coral I want to take a snip of here on the corner. On the right? Yep. Right it. We've been seeing a lot of these and we are not, we're not real confident what it is. So we'll take a, a small sample of the organism and bring it up and we can look at it in more details and send, uh, potentially send the sample to a couple taxonomic experts and get a better sense of what it is. So Brian, earlier today or earlier this shift, we saw a mollusk worm. Is it possible to see nudibranchs down this deep? Yep, a few exist. Um, I don't know really this deep exactly, uh, but certainly they exist in the deep sea. I'm not sure what the maximum depth they cut off at, but you'll see, you will see nudibranchs sometimes. You also see flatworms sometimes. I think we more often see flatworms, frankly. but I don't know exactly what depth they cut off at. I love flatworms. They're so mesmerizing to watch how they just move around. They're so cute. question for you. So the sand that we're seeing right now on the ocean floor, is that different than sand that we would see on a beach? I think, um, uh, push in there for me, Darrell. I think maybe some of it is similar. So sand that you see on a beach is, yeah, right uh, quartz and quartz is this, uh, it's literally just, uh, silica or that's what we call it. But it's this very um, for me. quite resistant mineral. Uh, so when you weather any sort of rock, okay, the thing that you expect to be left is quartz. And so that's why it's on beaches. Um, so it's definitely possible that some of this is, you mm -hmm. know, weathered rock what quartz. What boxes do we have? Where, um, where can this go? But I also uh, think. You put it in the. Push right in, Daryl. The, the starboard bio box in the aft compartment. Starboard aft. Aft inner, all the way back. Right here. Uh, you can zoom in tight there if you want. And, uh, nice shot of the Paragorgia here. Steve saying that, that we collected one very similar to this. Um, he collected one that was very similar to this when he was down here in 2019 and they did a full a good genetic workup here on this uh, this one to see where it fits in the taxonomic tree and it's definitely a paragorgia so 027 yeah so zero two sample 027 is yeah, a, let me get in the neighborhood yet here. to be fully identified branching black coral okay I don't know or it's mainly a whip, but it kind of has a branch or two. It's good, thanks.
One second. Okay, close box. Zero two three was a stocked crinoid. Zero two four. Um, actually, open the box. Sorry, I think I still got it. Zero two five was a small rock. Got it. You're welcome. Okay, close, close, close. Wait, wait, wait. Oh yeah, black holes are floaty. I, sorry, I should have warned you about that. Okay, close. All right, that the starboard box is full, right? Oh uh, yeah. I'm not All right, sure. let's not open it again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> good. Whatever you do, don't open the box. No, Dan, no. Last night we had so many people commenting about what's in the box. Don't open the box. Uh, video, you can go wide, please. It's Schrodinger's sample. We don't know it's there until we open the box. <laughs> Where are you? All right, we've, we've been making pretty good pretty good pace, but we'll have to keep it up for the rest of our watch and the next if we want to make the top. But we're doing good. We have been mm -hmm. remarkably restrained and not chasing every little thing. Can we, uh, is it all right to open the front box? Uh, yes. I think so. The you want to run the open. front box out for me real quick? How are However, I do want to look at whatever the white fluffy thing is in front of you once yeah, you're done that. getting oriented. I think that might be a Walteria sponge. Okay, you can close that box, thanks. That's my favorite sponge. Let me stand back. Uh, why don't you come down a few minutes? This guy here? Yep. You can go ahead, Daryl. Yep, this looks like a Walteria sponge. It's a genus uh, of Euplectelid. It is probably the easy, one of the easiest to identify sponges we see out here. And it's got a nice little collection of um, brittle stars. Really, the sponges get the short end of the stick on this one. Like They are probably every bit as important as ecosystem engineers in the deep sea, um, but they don't get nearly as much love as the corals. And part of that is they're really hard to tell apart. OK, I got it. That's good enough. Make some tracks here. Yep. Um, so just a quick update on where we are and where we're headed. Um, if we are cruising along um, and not making a bunch of stops, it'll take about two hours for us to get to waypoint five. Um, if we're still planning a 10 a.m. recovery, um, we need to be off bottom um, around 8.20. Um, it's about seven o'clock right now. so. Um, I don't think we'll quite make it to waypoint five if we're still planning a 10 o'clock recover. I think Dwight and I were chatting at the shift change and I think we, if we need to, we can push to a, a noon or just after lunch recovery and okay. be just fine. All right. Um, we'll confirm that at shift change at eight. Um, but I think we can op I think we can safely plan on recovering right at the end of the next watch. Okay. mess with people's sleep schedules a little bit less too. Oh, and it's tight all right. You're good. You're good. Dan, if you can, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what happens once the ROVs come back on deck? Do you have to prep them a lot for the next dive? Are there any special uh, things that you need to do to get them ready or recovered. 
I don't think she's on SPL, is she? Am I? Oh, <laughs> oh no, I was not. <laughs> but I could still hear. I yeah, heard most here of I'll it. repeat the question for SPL then, since apparently I muted myself and didn't even realize it, um, which explains some things. But when the vehicles Can come you back come on down, a um, couple meters, I still can't hear you, Katie. Really? No. Well, I what can hear you, like, through the air, but not through the headphones. Mm, I should be okay. Let's turn it up. Okay. What's happening there? Try again. All right, let's, third That's time? That's better. Yeah, okay, sorry. perfect. So when the vehicles are up on deck, is there any special procedures or any certain things that you have to do to either prepare them for the next dive or I don't want to say recover them from this dive. So I don't know, decompress them. <laughs> decompress them, that's funny. Um, yeah, we have to do quite a bit of work, uh, post dives, pre dives. So uh, we crawl all over the thing, check for, um, uh, there's a whole, there's pages of lists, like a pit stop. Uh, but the major things are, um, you know, getting all the samples off and getting all the science gear turned around and um, reconfiguring if we're changing, um, if our ballast changes. Um, yeah, I see it. Yeah, I'm struggling here. To, I'm stuck, basically. So about how long would it take you, bare minimum, from vehicles back on deck, doing all your checks, all preparing everything, till you can put the vehicles back in the water again? It's usually a couple hours. Uh, to our typical turnaround time on Nautilus is four hours. Four hours. And during that time, y'all are crazy busy working. Yeah, it's usually pretty busy four hours. There's, um, that gives us a little wiggle room to fix any uh, what we call a defects list, so there's usually um, there's usually some issues. I'm going to try and come the other way. I'm not making any progress here. Sorry, at the moment we're stuck tail to tail, so because the uh, tether comes out the back of Hercules it, and it does not back up very well. Basically, I can't go anywhere. I think I uh, drug Atlanta quite a way, so it's <coughs> as I back up, Atlanta's swinging back towards the ship. So Lynette, we heard from Dan and the ROV uh, process between launch and recovery, or re recovery and launch again. What is it like from a navigator's side? Is there a lot of things that y'all guys have to do to prepare for the next dive or clean up data from this dive? What's y'all's process? Sorry, was that for me? Yes, ma'am. Navigator, okay. Um, yeah, so, um, we don't have um, a lot to do um, at the end of a dive. Um, we pretty much save all of our data, um, all of our sample points, um, uh, yeah, update some charts and me. things like You're that for the next dive. Here. But um, post dive is um, not too busy for us. Uh, most of our work is done on the pre-dive end. Um, and for that, we need to prepare our maps, um, get them all loaded into the software that we're using for navigation. Um, we need to deploy a USBL transceiver. That's something that we deploy through a moon pool in the ship. Um, and that's a instrument, an acoustic instrument that we use to help locate Atalanta and Hercules subsea. Um, and there's some um, 
calibration involved with that um, each time we deploy it. Um, let's see, what else? Um, Can you that's most one of, of those every dive from the moon pool at the, in the gym. Sorry, say that again. So you were saying that you have to do a, what is it, UPL? Receiver? USBL. USBL yep. receiver, and you do it through the moon deck. Yep. Yep, um, so that gets uh, deployed before every dive and retrieved out. after every dive. Yep. And that's, the moon pool's in the gym, right? Yes. How yep. have I never seen this? I want to come watch it the, <laughs> for the next dive. Yeah, I want to see the moon pool come open. I got to come back where it's Yeah, can't we can definitely yep. take a peek at that. Come up uh, four meters. Yeah, the moon pool is essentially a hole uh, that goes down through the center of the ship, um, and we can lower instruments down through it. So, And I thought it was a relic from the past, something that we never got to use anymore. Clearly, yep. I was wrong. Every dive. Back down four meters. Oh. Roger. Might have to. It's just, uh, I can't get enough slack to come around there. I think I'm getting the uh, layback too. Yeah, why don't you, you're going to have to try to do uh, 20 meters towards us, see if that helps. 20 meters of stern. came up a bit there. I took my C bias off to try and get that last bit of uh, doing everything I can to get uh, all the hydraulic power available. Still not uh, oh, so close. I don't know, the layback's got us or whatever, but we're almost getting it. Okay, you can stop that move, I got it. I think, I think I got it.
You can uh, get her moving back on the uh, three whatever heading. Okay, back in the box there, finally. So if any educators or parents are listening at home, you can actually have your student's classroom Zoom call the ship. It's called a ship to shore interaction. You can find that on nautiluslive.org. There is down a bit for us to under the education tab. So it's been kind of nice because for the past two days we haven't had interactions because it's been Saturday and Sunday. But starting back up tomorrow on Monday, we have another full so slate of interactions scheduled. IRC. Yeah, that's a bamboo. Something was just swimming past. Bring our head to the left so much. 300. So looking at the sand ripples, the bed form, it is kind of all over the place. So that should mean that currents are going not really consistently in one direction. Here's another one of those uh, Parisocrinus um, sea star, uh, excuse me, sea lilies or uh, stalked crinoid. So I call your auto heading again, but I'm probably pulling on you now. What is that whirly? Likely a bamboo, but I'd have to get a little bit closer look to be sure. Go ahead, Daryl, zoom in there, please. Huh. Yep, bamboo. What makes it yeah. whirly and not, not straight? straight. And that's a Metallogorgia right there. I don't have a good answer for your why some are swirly and some are straight.
but I could pretty clearly see a node there and had those big fleshy tissue, lots of tissue, yeah. thick coanochyme. Mm -hmm. I always kind of like looking at our stats and seeing what countries are tuning in right now. Of course, we have America, Canada, the UK, but we also have a country called Jersey, Latvia, Turkey, Italy, Norway, Hungary, Spain, yeah, Denmark, Switzerland, cool. Portugal, the Netherlands. All right. Yeah. So thank you to all those countries tuning in and joining us. Underneath you from across the world. Another little bottle brush Chrysogorgia there going by. Another crinoid. Definitely terrain's changed a little bit back in the sand for a touch. Yeah, I tried to cheat and uh, go up the hill there, but I got too far away from oh, that's fine. Want to, so. At the uh, end of this ship move, if we're still in the sand, Let's see if we can see what happens. We try and push core of the sand. Yeah, we'll be in the sand, I reckon. Yep. It's another bamboo coral. Tall one there. There was a little chrysogorgia off the side of the rock. Oh, big swell set just came through. Yeah, let's take a look at this one that you're setting up on. Mm, go ahead and zoom in there. Since I'm already touching the rock. I'm not sure what this is. Help, Steve. Hmm. <laughs> oh, it's a black. This might be Trisopathies. Can you tell it's black because of the skeleton? Yeah, I know from the, the shape of the polyps. Um, it doesn't have the, the octocoral polyps of mm -hmm. the, that are ringed. Can zoom in some more for him there. Hmm. Um, and that looks like it might be the remnants of an egg case as well, of something laid an egg on it and then hatched. That attachment point in the dead center that kind of looks like a mouth or even like a clam shape. Um, might be some type of cephalopod or shark um, egg attachment place. Steve says it looks like a hydroid. Ah. Yep, I see that now that he says that. I can see the little tips of the tentacles have mouths as well. Yeah, absolutely, it's a hydroid. Thanks, is, Steve. Is a hydroid also a black coral? No. Oh. Nope, different. Still an Idarian, but fairly distance within the within the night areas. All right, science is good. Thank you. Okay, go in. So we are outside of the remote Pacific Island National Marine Monument, but about how far are we from Palmyra Atoll? And I don't know who that question goes out to. Roughly 100 miles. Morning. So about 100 miles north, northeast? Yep. Uh, nor north, northwest, probably. We're going to hold here in the net. He wants to do a core sample out here in the sand. Can you open the iris on 
Atlanta there for a second. up a little bit. So for those at home, there's a little bit of a discussion about um, what time we should be pulling out, what time's our recovery, what waypoint we want to end our, our dive on. This is a sea pen we haven't seen um, yet today, certainly. Um, but I know we collected one of the one of something very similar in Helena Baker two years ago because um, they're kind of actually really hard to collect. They can s retract back into the sediment. Zoom um, in there. there, and they're kind of a cool little little creature. If you're set up here and yeah. Um, Fixing to uh, pull out a core tube. Go ahead, zoom in there. Full zoom. Yeah. One bio box. Yeah, two push cores. All right, thanks for that great view of the sea pen. And then... Yeah, um, I see a little crab behind it. I did not. Oh, now I do, do yep. Do do do. Uh, we want a core sample here, right? Yeah, let's see if it'll it'll hold. Uh, which... Uh, I know Robert was taking some last night. Which, uh, which ones are already taken? Chris, which ones do we take uh, already? Core samples. We got one, two, and three. So four and five are available. Yeah. Uh, rather. So Steve says the little C pen we're looking at is protopatilium. Patidium. which we have sampled several times and have good genetic sequences of. Ron, you were saying that some sea pins disappear into the sand and then some Don't. stay out. Yep. I this believe this one is a run and hide one. Okay. Or not run and hide, but certainly hide. So we're going to attempt a push core, which we're going to take a clear acrylic um, tube and s shove it down in the sediment here and give us uh, 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 the ability to see some of the layers um, of sediment and um, collect the top of it or all of it and look through it for the myofauna and the stuff that live uh, in, the, in the sediment that are too small to really see with uh, even the great macro features on Hercules' Zeus camera. Um, and the trick out here in this type of terrain that's so sandy is a lot of times the sand doesn't have enough um, cohesion to hold in the tube and it just pours back out. So we'll give it a try here. Zoom out of it for us. That's good, thanks. 
Is this our first port push core of the night? No, this will be number four of the of this dive. Oh, twitchy manipulator. Hmm. Let's uh, pause for a second and see if it's going to go spastic again on me. Too. Okay. You happy here? Yep, that should be fine. Any bets on whether the sea pen will run away? <laughs> well, it certainly might. Get a little mud, hopefully. Feels, feels like it. Deep. And a good one. Hmm, it's in there. Stuck. That's good. Yeah, it'll hold them. Wow. Close there. Now it's 20 paces to the outhouse by Willie. Make it. Oh, oh. Can't wait to see it in the next camera. We're gonna make it. <laughs> We're in the moment of we can't see it on camera quite yet. No, no. Oh, it's still oh. got a lot. No, it's still got a lot in there. Uh, go for it. Yeah, there it goes. It's, oh no, nope, and it blew. Oh. <laughs> Maybe this wasn't quite fast enough. Let me shake it out and try again. Sure, we'll give it one, one more try. Um, <coughs> can you hit the sample salvo for me? Oh, wait, I'll do it. I got it. I haven't tried this one in a while. And uh, I'll pick another location. Can you go uh, do your uh, H2 one thing there again? H2 PC4. Sorry, H12 PC4. I don't have a lot of push core experience, but does it make sense to rotate wrist and keep it upside down? Uh, that's not allowed typically. Okay. Then it uh, shakes up the. Yeah, it mixes up the layers. Yeah. Um, might get lucky here if I'm closer to the. Uh, closer to the uh, quiver here.
trying to get as greedy as I can without pushing the top of the core into the uh, into the top of the uh, if you get too much it disturbs the top layer and blows out the, the vent if I cheat with a manipulator and get all the way around here when I and I don't have to pause halfway I can Hopefully do it in one motion. So one of the things people don't really think about um, is how difficult working the manipulator arm is because you don't have stereo vision. So depth perception from humans is based largely on the ha us having two eyes looking at things from slightly different angles, and we don't have that on the vehicle. Um, so you have to use multiple cameras um, to get a sense of your different directions of motion. And it's really hard to do fine depth perception motions like putting a push core back in its holder because um, you don't have that native stereo vision. You have to use multiple different cameras with different angles uh, to look at different axis of motions with the manipulator arm. It's quite the skill to learn to be able to do quickly and efficiently uh, like the pilots can with the years of experience. Uh, Roger, 028. Yep. I think there's something in there. Let's give it one more spastic love tap here. Right. All right. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Not sure how good of a core that is, but we're not we're, for this one. We're not so much worried about the the layering as trying to get the top five centimeters. So mm. even if it got shook and mixed up a little bit, we're probably okay. Sweet. What are you looking for in the top five centimeters? Uh, so we had a couple um, oppor survey of opportunity requests for looking at the Miofauna uh, in the top and potentially doing some uh, community DNA and potentially some okay, microbial studies. You can go studies. back to do your H1, H1, two PC4 thing again, please. Rather spoiled with that. All right, so we've got about Ooh. three and a half, four hours of bottom time remaining awesome. um, to make it to the top of the seamount. And we should be able to do that if we keep on moving at the pace we've been moving. You can go wide video and let it, you can light the afterburners. <laughs> I don't even think we need to go any faster than we have been going, <laughs> but maybe a the little bit. The blazing speed of 300 milli knots. <laughs> I used to, when I used to navigate, I'd drive the bridge and nuts doing that. Well, uh, what is that, half a walking speed? So we have a question about the marine... Um, What's that? ...cetaceans around here. <laughs> so may, I know we're a little bit too deep to be seeing most cetaceans, most whales and dolphins right here, but around Palmyra Island and Kingman Reef, are there typically a lot of whales out there, a lot of dolphins? Um, yeah, we get quite a few cetaceans. There's um, bottlenose dolphins and spinner dolphins, and there's melon-headed whales, uh, or the electro dolphin. Wait, you, uh, which whales? Uh, melon-headed whales. Oh, okay. Uh, there's a large resident pod around there. Um, there have been orcas seen around there, but pretty rarely. Do y'all get any humpbacks? Um, it's not on their typical migration path. 
but are you full they wide may there? have been by yeah. there at some point. And some of the larger Roca whales Oops. probably come by, but they're pretty hard to find. So they don't go, come too shallow in. They stay a little bit farther out. Yeah. You should get occasional sperm whales hunting along the equatorial line, wouldn't you? I guess you're a little far north, probably, for on the line. Yeah, they, yeah, they probably still come around, but yeah. Yeah, I, to my knowledge, no one has seen one off of our little boat. <laughs> Cute little Chrysogorgia bush there. Looks like the skeleton of a bamboo on the top side. So question that came in, if you could be any deep sea critter, who would you be? I'd be a sperm whale, without a shadow of a doubt. Dumbo octopus. They're cute and um, they're smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking. Not spicy cucumber. Push in a bit, Daryl. I was going to say, Brian, can you say anything Just like a bit but coral? Oh, yeah, I it's wouldn't good. be a coral. Good. Corals have boring <laughs> lives. <laughs> They're interesting, but Ooh. I would want to move. The idea of being welded in place for the rest of my life would not work. <laughs> oh, this guy is beautiful. Cool. I'm so mesmerized. Pushing just a bit more. Probably a Chonicops. Kind of looks grumpy, doesn't do a lot, but still can move. <laughs> Chonicops is always a favorite. They uh, lasers for me. Right? What was the other one that you said looks like a Chonox? Just a touch there. Chonox. Chonox. Chon. Chonox. Ox. He just looks so much grumpier than a Chonox. <laughs> <laughs> Out just that it. sea cucumber is putting on a beautiful display. This is an in a in a paps. I'm gonna get the Latin wrong here. In a panastes is the name of this particular holothurian. Trying to get uh, 60 seconds of smooth video, but not gonna happen. If I take my hands off the controls, maybe it will happen. Ooh. The sheer athletic grace. 